I want you, in fact, to go to Romans chapter number four. I'm preaching on stagger, but I want to add something to that. I want to tell everybody that is in this house, from the men to the women and the young people to our elderly, stagger not. Tell your neighbor, don't stagger. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise. Smile at somebody and say, I'm not going to stagger at the promise. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Hallelujah. Father, bless the word of God today as it goes forth from my mouth to vessels of clay and flesh, but of honor and glory. We just ask God that this word will go forth that it will touch nations, that it will touch many people, from ministers to, to preachers, pastors, evangelists, prophets, apostles, teachers. Father, touch them, help them. God, encourage your body. God, bring strength to us. Thank you for the joy. Thank you, God, for what was spoken by the Spirit that God, you sent special for us this morning. Father, I pray that your will is going to be done in the name of the Lord. Let everybody say amen. And to amen. Can we give God praise and thank him for all that he is doing? I made a little note at the top of my notes here only to be reminded to tell you thank you again. For those of you that gave over last weekend, I was able off internet, able to tell you what that amount was. But let me tell you happily, let me tell you joyfully that last Sunday, two weeks ago, was the offering that we pushed for, which was miracle offering. Thank you so much to everybody that gave. And on Sunday morning up to Sunday night, it went up past another $10,000 by Sunday night. And I gave you the grand total on Sunday evening and then came back Wednesday and told you what was added to that. And let me just tell you, less, just a little less than $10,000 of that great, great amount ends up coming in the following Sunday as well. Isn't God good? So whoever, uh, whoever might have perhaps forgotten and wanted to make certain that they put it in the following Sunday over the last two weeks, thank you so much for doing that. And again, once I start talking about everything that we're doing, people kind of start getting behind it and saying, well, there's a lot that's going to happen here over the next couple of um, now weeks to maybe a month. So thank you so much for uh, being so kind to give. I want to preach for a few moments. It's time to get to work. Hallelujah. I want to preach on Stagger Knot, found in Romans chapter 4 from verse 17 through verse 21, written to the Romans. Habakkuk 2 verses 1 to 4 talks about writing the vision. And if you get an opportunity to read that, please do, because it will really lay out for you not only a challenge, but should be a goal, that you start writing out the vision. Several, several years ago, the Lord started laying it upon my heart to write some envelopes to yourself and congratulate yourself in advance for what I have done for you and then stick it in the envelope, lick it and glue it and put it away. Write the vision on the outside of it and the congratulatory letter on the inside. And so what I began doing is writing myself letters, congratulations on 70 acres of land on the highway, congratulations on the brand new building, congratulations on the Dunamis Center, congratulations on overhangs. And I started saying congratulations to me and I would write myself a letter for the future. And when I opened up the letter in the future, I always had something that I should go get as a reward for all of the hard work that was done. And so what I did was I wrote the vision and I made it plain. And I licked it and sticked it and I stuck it and put it away. And when I did that, I, I 
I, I referenced it on the day it was completed and opened it up and said, God, you can go get this now. You've got to be able to write the vision and to make it plain. It is so powerful how you've got to write it down. It, it, it is the words. It is the words that you write down that become very important to you. Let me say that when you write it down, you start believing by faith that it's going to happen. So much so that I gave three scriptures in the New Testament. Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. That regardless of what circumstances look like, all three of those scriptures say this, and the just shall live by faith. And so you've got to have faith in your life, and you've got to have hope in your life to know that God is going to do specifically what he promised he's going to do. Paul, when he wrote to Philippi to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 13, he said this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those which are before. In verse 14, Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If in every area of your life you are pressing toward the mark, if in every, every area of your life you are pressing toward God, if in every arena of life you are doing everything you can from raising your boys to raising your girls to raising grandbabies to helping with grandkids from just helping your family in general. If in everything you do, you press toward the mark of God, you are not going to miss it. Peter knew when he got out of the boat and left the other disciples and started walking on the water that God has got this. But it was when he took his eyes off of the Lord and started concentrating on what was happening around him that he began to sink. I don't believe the scripture relates to us that he went under. I believe that Jesus caught him before he ever lost an ounce of breath and snatched him up out of there. The fact is, saints of God, you have got to keep your eyes on the Lord. I would say to dads that are here today coming off of my notes because I feel a little push in my soul. Daddies, it is your greatest responsibility to raise your children in the fear and the admonition of God. Your greatest investment is not in a bank somewhere. Your greatest investment is not in a bank bag tucked away, hidden somewhere. Your greatest investment is those little two-legged creatures called children that God blessed us with. With all due respect, that is our greatest investment. I believe we ought to protect our schools like the banks protect their money because our greatest investment is not on paper or gold. Our investment it is in those precious children that are the next generation of carriers of this great gospel, that are the next tongue talkers, that are the next revivalists, that are the next missionaries. Daddies, we've got a responsibility. I want to say this to all of our church family. It is not the pastor's responsibility to raise children. It's the father and the mother's responsibility to raise children. I do not believe the finality is in the electric chair. It ought to start in the high chair. I believe that the problem that exists today is simply put right there. It starts right there. You don't give them their way in everything they ask for. No is just as important as a yes is. Let me tell you from pastoring, as long as I pastor, people love me when I'm preaching good. People love me when I tell them yes. People love me when I give them what they want. But those same group of people that loves you when you're giving them everything they want, give them no one time and watch how deep your relationship is. I've got to be able to pastor a church of this size saying no at times and yes at times and at other times I got to pray about it. See how the amens become scarce when you start preaching like that. It is what it is. Dad and moms, you are not their best friend. You are their parents and that will never change. 
it's okay to share things with them, but I would not share gossip with them. I would not share bad news with them. I would not share things that are going to hurt them and stunt their faith and stunt their growth. I know I'm not going to get any popularity stars on this one, but I'm going to preach on anyhow because dads and moms, you're going to have to get over yourself. You're going to have to figure about your drama, your problems, and your trouble. You're going to have to get your tail back in church, and you're going to have to raise those children in the fear and admonition of God. We are going to lose our country if we don't get our kids back. I didn't mean to say all that. But I'm not taking it back and I'm not going to apologize. Let me tell you something. I got pushed and pushed and pushed. When you going to get married? When you going to ask her to marry you? And finally, I knew she was the right one, so I asked her to marry me. After the pushing to get married was over, it was the push, when you going to give me some grandbabies? I want some grandbabies. I want me a Chelsea, and I want me a Nicholas and a Carly. And my grandparents said, when you going to get me some grand, great grandbabies, Toddy boy? I said, well, we'll do the best we can when the time comes. That, that, that comes naturally. We'll have to let the Lord take care of them. Let me tell you something. I love Christmas time. Now, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a little, you know, when it gets to be uh, September, I get uh, the whole month's my birthday. Jill's birthday's in there. Carly's birthday's in September. Nicholas at the end of August. Jill's got a brother. Jill's got a dad. It's their birthday in September. But I'm telling you right now, uh, about the last of August, it starts to, I start getting giddy. I say, whoop, it's birthday time. I know mine's not till the end of the month, but I'm telling you, that's the last thing I can hold on to that's mine. It's my birthday. Hallelujah. You get children, you lose Christmas. I went to my first Christmas when I had baby Chelsea and we picked her up in a carrier and we took her into the house and I found out really quick, Christmas is not about you anymore. They forgot about me. I just got handed an envelope and they said, get what you want. But the babies, they got all these gifts wrapped up around the tree and I thought, Lord, have mercy. This isn't about me anymore. And I tell you, the older I get, the more I start finding out, this is not about me anymore. The older I get as a pastor, I'm finding out more. Hey, this isn't about you anymore. Ask old brother Abraham. Hey, Abraham, how's your life? Well, it's not about me anymore. The Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And when I found that out, I said, what in the world have I got to do with this? My factory is shut down, and so is hers over there. Sarah's done. And God said, no, she's not. They ended up with an Ishmael. That was a mistake, Uh uh-huh. But then God gave them their Isaac. Abraham found out really quick, this is not about me anymore. This is about the next generation. Abraham got to the age where God said, I'm not just thinking about you. I'm setting this thing up for the next generation and the one after that. And at 52, I can tell you, it is starting to become about the next generation. We have got to raise up some God-fearing, sin-chasing, devil-killing, tongue-talking young people to fill in the gap to the next generation that they're already quickly becoming. I'm speaking to some dads that I know are going to watch this after a while. You need to get up off that couch. You need to put the cap on that two liter of classic Coke. You need to get rid of your buttered popcorn. You need to get your kids up and get them in the house of God. It is not my responsibility to raise them or fix them when they get in trouble. It's yours, sir. And you need to come to the house of God. Wrap your arms around those boys. Pray for them in the altar. Look past yourself and get the next generation where they... I just I feel like preaching here today. Woo. It's going to get real quiet now. You can hear it. Crickets. This is our responsibility. It's our responsibility. Now, I don't kiss my son in the mouth anymore. Once he started growing a beard, I said, this feels funny. I'm not doing this. I'll kiss you on the cheek over here where there's not all this grisly stuff. I'll hug your neck. I'll tell him how much I love him. I text him and tell him I love him. I wrap my arms around him. I affirm him. I tell him he does great. I tell him he's wonderful. Tell my girls the same thing. They know that. I love on them. I hug them when I see them. Hug them when they leave. 
do my son-in-law the same way. Now, I haven't kissed my son-in-law and don't plan on it. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's probably happy about that. Now, he's, he doesn't have some phobia or something, but it is what it is. Hallelujah. But let me tell you, this is how I feel about them. I affirm them. I tell them they did great. I love them. I'm proud of them. I'm thankful for them. And I'm not going to tell them at the end of my days. I'm going to tell them now. I'm going to affirm them. I'm going to help them. I'm going to jump in when they ask me. I'm going to be an encouragement to them. The greatest possession your children will hold on to is the words of an affirming father. I'm proud of you, son. I think you're doing a great job. And this is going to work out for God's glory, and you're going to be in his plan, and it's going to be incredible. Our sons need this, Dad. And if you won't give it to them, it's going to fall on the church to love them and to help raise them. But we need dads to come back to remember like I did at Christmas time. This isn't about me anymore. This is now about my children. And now when I go places, and I'm thankful that people are glad to see me. I'm thankful. I woke up to my pastor friends that I preached for for years. And I walk up to them and they shake my hand and say, oh, Brother Ty, man, it's good to see you. I, I feel like a kid in a candy store when you come to our church. I'm so glad. To see. That's what I used to get. And now I see them and they shake my hand, oh, Brother Todd. Man, would you sing that one song? Or, or, or man, I love you. And within seconds, did your kids come with you? <laughs> Happens that fast. Quickly, I'm starting to find out it's the next generation that we've got to win. And it doesn't start with Pastor Todd affirming everybody. It doesn't start with Sister Jill. It starts with dads that have to take the rightful place. Love on that boy. Love on those girls. Don't give them everything they want. And don't jump in every time something happens around them that you gotta hover like a helicopter and like you gotta take care of everything. I survived. I got picked on every once in a while. My mom didn't always jump in. I come home and said, Mom, you won't believe what happened. My mom, man, she was old time. She was hill jack. When it came to stuff like that, my mom would get up. She didn't say, I'm calling the principal. She said, you hit him back? I said, no. He does that again. You wad your fist up as tight as you can. You punch him right in the mouth. That's what mom said to me. You might think to me, wow, you've become a preacher. What did you take away from that? I took away that every time the enemy messes with me, I ain't going to run to my parents. I got to wad my fist up and say, hey, devil, this is for you, baby. I didn't say spoil them. I didn't say give them everything they want. I said affirm them and love on them, but stand them up when they get spoiled and cry to you about everything that goes on. Come on, I know it's 2022 and you're gonna call me old fashioned. And you're gonna say, now nah, preacher, now, nah. no, no, no. I'm telling you saints of God, there are things they have to go through on their own. There are things we have to watch them go through knowing what the end is going to be. But God, please help my babies. I don't even want to look around. Because I feel in this house that, that, that some people need to understand where my heart is. I'm, I'm telling you, if we're not careful, saints of God, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we're going to raise them up to the point where they just can't wait to run away from church. And I want to raise them up until they get to the point where I can't wait to get involved. Man, it did my heart good when I walked in here and watched one of our seniors that just graduated, little brother Spencer Mills, I call him Hot Rod now, and we'll leave that alone. But I was so glad when I came up on this stage and I seen him up in the middle of the choir just praising God and singing. I said, come on, Jesus. I said, come on, Lord. I said, hallelujah. I want them to love coming to this place. 
I'm just going to say this and I'm going to be as respectful as I can. I can't go to everything, but I was able to go to a couple of little parties yesterday and we've got this big old farm boy that we've, that, that, that's been raised in this church. And, and, and man, I pull, I pull my truck in there and he come, he come walking real fast out of the, out of where they were having the party. I'm not going to tell too much now. He come walking over, ask my wife. He come over, he said, of all the people that I was hoping was going to be here today. Oh, pastor, I was hoping you were going to show up here. It's, I, I mean, you had to come here today. I took such interest in him. I looked around at what he, he had tractors set up here and there. I just crawled on him even though I was bigger than the tractor. And I just crawled on him and I talked to him and I encouraged him. Listen, saints of God, I want people to love to come to redemption. I want them to say, oh my goodness, it's Sunday. I can't wait to go to the house of God. Come on, saints of God, if we don't get them, we'll lose them. Oh, let's give God some good praise. Come on. I ran some rabbit trails. You need to start learning in your life to call those, call those things that are not as though they were. God can call those things that be not as though they were. That means God can call things into your life that is not there right now. God can call things into your life. He can call things into your life. You can write it down. I'm waiting on this, God. I want this to happen. And when you write it down, he will call things into your life that are not as though they were. But you cannot stagger. The definition of stagger is to walk or move unsteadily as if you're about to fall. According to the word of God, it was all the seed of Abraham. It was all the seed that he was going to bless, that he was going to prosper. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. And everybody said amen right there. The Bible said that against hope. That means Abraham said, that woman is past the flower of her age. How in the world is this going to happen? There are times in your life you can't ask God how it's going to happen. You just follow God's plan. We look around the world today and it amazes me. It amazes me that we've ran out of toilet paper. This is the United States of America. How in the stinking world did we run out of toilet paper with all due respect? And now they claim we're running out of formula for our babies. Did someone forget that God planted milk on that mama when she's going to have a baby? And you telling me that we're running out is, can I get a witness from but we're not running out of alcohol and we're not running out of liquor and we're not running out of marijuana and they're not running out of crack and they're not running out of cocaine. Oh, you ain't helping me at all now, somebody. Don't you tell me that devil is a liar. <laughs> Push your neighbor, say he preaching now. against hope if you look at everything that's going on in the world right now it's against hope we're thinking oh my goodness what in the world are we going to do we're going to do what we've always done if God has to drop off manna from heaven if God has to send a raven to feed the prophets if God has to split the water and we walk across on dry ground if God has to put us in the fire and we look around and the fourth man's in the fire God is going to do what God has to do he will send bread he will send meat. He will send quail, baby. It is impossible, Sarah. It is impossible, Abraham. But with God, all things are possible. Do I look stressed out? Do I look like I'm about to lose my mind? Do I look like I've bitten off my fingernails when they need trim right now? No, I'm telling you, I know that God is so in control that I put it in his hands. That God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you ask a thing. You better stand up and shout, devil, you are a liar. God's got my life. God's got my family.
it. God's got my babies. God's got my marriage. God's got my hope. God's got it. Get some old time shouters that'll get out in the alleyway, shout all the way up and shout all the way back. Come on. hoped who who again oh there were some things I said no God no 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 God I'm not gonna say that we're gonna have a ton of visiting fathers here God I'm not gonna say God said you will say it and I was trying not to say it I was trying to talk God out of it but I started feeling that anointing Uh, that ointment got up on me and I I just went ahead and opened up my mouth and let it all out but I'm telling you the Bible said against hope they had hope against hope they had hope against hope God this world's a mess God this is a mess this is a mess this is a mess oh God I don't know how in the world this is ever going to turn around but they had hope in the midst of no hope God I don't know how you're going to fix my children there's no hope but against no hope there is hope that God is able when God starts working in the background when God starts moving and you thought it was all dead when Jesus shows up when Jesus showed up at Lazarus' tomb they said he's dead and he stinks by now but Jesus said Lazarus come forth and Lazarus got up walking in grace clothes and the Lord then said loose him and let him go and he took off walking I'm telling you I got hope against hope that revival is going to hit America again that revival is going to hit redemption that your boys and your girls are coming in you need to wipe that off your face put a smile on there and say I know that God is Come on. Come on. I don't want half the church. I want everybody. I want everybody to stand up and begin pushing your neighbor. Say it's coming. Revival is on. Woo. Y'all mind if I preach four more minutes? The promise was at 99 years old. Mm, Yes. And at 99, stuff gets wrinkled on the face. At 99, some of them gray hairs start peeking up on the mountaintop. At 99, they start showing up on your facial hair. At 99, they call them crow's feet. And now they've got stuff for $250 a bottle that you can rub it on your face at night. Wake up in the morning and feel like you're 76 when you're 99. Oh, yes. They've got cream that'll take care of age spots. I've been around enough people that have money that travel with $250 bottles of cream and say I put this on every night and it hides the scarecrow feet and it hides the cancer spots and it hides the sun spots makes me look like I'm 52 I'd rather just go on and live and look like I look and say I earned these crow's feet and I earned these spots and I earned the gray I got nothing against putting a little black on your beard I may do that after a while but right now I choose to name every single gray one I may put a little something on my sideburns so if I come in and got a little black on me it's not going to be Halloween it's I decided to take a few years off my looks Mm, yes but I come by to tell you he was 99 and Sarah was 89 there's some of you that feel like God has showed up at the last part of your years but the Lord wants you to know that I'm not done yet I feel like telling somebody that God said I'm not done you 
you just get up and shout a real quick second, some stuff's going to break who's in this house. Come on, man of God. Come on, man of God. Push your neighbor and say, I want strength on my pastor. Come on, man of God. Tell your neighbor I'm praying for that man of God. He staggered not. He staggered not at the unbelief. He didn't let it move him. All the stuff I've had to go through just the last little while. Come on, saints of God. And I'm not here for group therapy. And I'm not here to share with you everything I've had to go through. But there's been some stuff I had to look at and couldn't stagger. There's some stuff I had to look at and go to church and put my suit on in the back and walk out here and say to God be the glory. Stand up in the pulpit and say, praise the Lord, everybody. Because I couldn't stagger. I had to get it right. I had to preach under persecution and tribulation and mess and strife and stress. Come on, somebody. I'm glad Jesus showed me under pressure. He said, not my will, but your will be done. There's something about Jesus so perfect. He's impeccable. But he wanted to carry out the will of his father. Somebody grab your neighbor and shout. Now press on. He didn't stagger. He just kept walking. He just kept walking. Okay, God, that's what I'll do. Okay, God. Sarah means laughter. Because... They told her what was going to happen. <laughs> she started snickering. Sarah means laughter. Sarah, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> Pardon me. You laughing? You're going to have a baby. You're going to have a baby. Um, let me grab Hagar. You can do what you want to. But you're going to have a baby. There's some of you trying to put off what God wants to do on somebody else. God is saying to people in here, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to raise you up. You are not going to turn out like everybody else. Oh, God, you, you can use somebody else. No, 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 no. You can put me off if you want to, but I'm going to come back to you. And you are going to carry this baby. Abraham, Abraham staggered not at the blessing of God. Genesis 18 and verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I, I can tell you there is nothing too hard for God. You know why I can tell you that? Look at this place. There is nothing too hard for God. Just walk outside. I can promise you there is nothing too hard for God. There is no way this should have happened given my personal circumstances. But I just chose to believe that God was able to do everything he promised me. You need to look at your neighbor and say, just look at me. All that God has done, I should not be here. I should be mad at preachers. I should be mad at church people. I should be mad at denominations. I should be mad at the politics. I should be mad at what was said and how they did it and what they did and what happened was. But no, I'm sitting here because I choose to look past my circumstance and I have hope in something that is hopeless because I know that God is able to carry out what he promised. Let's stand together all over the church. I promise it's the last time I give out any other commandments. <laughs> I don't mean to pull on you. I don't mean to have you standing up and touching your neighbor. I only did it a couple times. Come on. But I just need to know you're with me. Sorry. Sorry. Not me. I just need you to know you're with us.
God spoke to me early this morning. I was, I was praying and I was thinking about this service and the Lord spoke to me. He said, he said, son, I want you to look in the camera and I want you to tell men that are hurting. I want you to tell men that are bogged down, that feel hopeless. I want you to tell men that aren't going to go back to church anymore because they're going to watch you. That's what God told me. So let me tell you how fortunate we are at this church. Most churches do not have the mix of men and women that we do. They do not. There's more women than there are men. And we have equal amounts. Is that not incredible, first of all? Is it not incredible? And then, and then we have, well, we used to have white people. Then summertime came, now we have tan people. And then we have black people and light-skinned people and darker, lighter. I mean, there's just, it's, it's amazing. It, it's amazing what God has done in this church. I'm not, I, I just believe this, I'll keep my opinions to myself, I suppose. I'll keep them there. I believe this. I believe people know down deep in the heart that I love them and that, and that I want to do the best for them and that I will do my best to go above and beyond to make sure that they're okay. And not because I have some great friendship with them it's because I'm their pastor and that friendship stuff's beside the point I have to pastor people I believe that with all my heart and I, and I believe God spoke to me and that's why I did that earlier when I stopped and pointed back there and went completely off my notes because God really dug down in my spirit and then he planted it there he said I want you to stop while you're preaching and I want you to call them to come back to church call them back in here and that's what I did. Because this isn't about us anymore. This thing's gotten to the point where it cannot become about one person here. Not even a pastor. It's too big. It's about all of us fitly framed together. That's what it's about. And I have to, and I've had to, start shifting and laying groundwork for the next generation that's already here, already stepped on the welcome mat and climbed up the steps and they're at the door right now. Because I'm 52. Hallelujah. But I'm really 32. I mean 25. Well, let's keep going. I'm 18. <laughs> In my spirit. But last night at 10.30, if you would have asked me, how old are you? I'd have said 52. <laughs> I got up this morning, and my little precious wife, first thing she said, how you doing, baby? I said, whew, I'll let you know. <laughs> you ever had mornings like that? Give me a few minutes. I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank God. I believe God has, God's given me a little influence. But I'm going to speak those things that are, that are not as though they were, perhaps. God's given me great influence. And I believe I can speak to people, people that are hurting and not coming, and people that are mad and frustrated. Get yourself back in here. I've been mad too. I promise you I've been mad. Have I been let down pe by people? I promise you. I promise you I have. So bad the knife went through the chest. And when I looked down, it was spinning. Come on, come on, come on, come on. But I just had to wipe the snot and dry my tears and just keep going. It's not always easy. I'm not promising you I'm perfect. Are you with me? It's time to get back, dads. Pastor Todd can't do this by himself. I need some strong daddies, some strong mamas that are going to put ourselves aside to reach people and help people.